My name is Scott Santos, and I'm just a presentation about computational based income. I'm the narrator of the today, the director of the intro of the company, and also the OSA, the president of the crowdfunding based income institute. Okay, so is work still working? So it's a lot harder to find a robot, uh, at 
until recently that could do like this lower scale work for you know minimum wage. There's another important chart to understand. You can see here that uh, automation is pretty much flatline routine work since 1990. The only growth that we're seeing is in non routine work. And that is also the work that can be handled by artificial intelligence. So we can expect non routine work to probably flatline too, especially non routine manual. Non routine cognitive is the most uh, difficult stuff to automate, but uh, AI is going to be able to handle a lot of that as well. The uh, well known labor market. Considered this the most important graph of his book, Not Working. And he said that you, know, you can see that the uh, unemployment rate of wage growth has been growing since 2008, quote, apparently irretrievably, is what he says. So you can see, traditionally, as the unemployment rate went down, then wage growth would go up. There's a pretty good kind of year between those two. And as the unemployment rate has plummeted since 2008, wage growth has not risen. Part of also thinking about work itself is thinking about unpaid work. One third of the entire population are informal characters. Uh, in the US, 1.2 million hours of unpaid care work goes on, or unpaid work goes on for week. It's equivalent to about 30 million full time care workers. And there's been multiple estimates. A conservative estimate is over $700 million per year. Uh, so we could uh, count this in forms of GDP if we actually paid it. Uh, but I've seen more than that, over a trillion dollars worth per year of unpaid work. And what's also interesting is that unpaid workers are actually paying to work. So not only not being paid, but they're actually on average spending seven thousand dollars per year to actually do unpaid work. I think it's really important also so when you're looking at unpaid work, it's just entirely intrinsically motivated, and a lot of traditional work is uh, extrinsically motivated. And uh, as long as we we essentially force people to work because they don't have access to their basic needs, then that's actually really bad for productivity. So in the US right now, two-thirds of the workforce is disengaged or not engaged at all by their work. Globally, only 13% of the working population are engaged by their work. It's been estimated that this lack of engagement in the work that we're doing cost us about $500 per year. I like this chart too because uh, you kind of have to see that if you have your basic needs covered, then you know you're more likely to be starting on like level three, and the work that you're doing is because you're interested in doing it. But if you actually have to do work only to survive, and that's the only reason you do that job, then that's when you're going to be pretty disengaged. Let's see if this works. So yeah, when you have, as long as you're focused on your basic needs, then that's what you're really it's occupying your mind. And then uh, once you're set those needs met, it's not like you do nothing. It's that you're able to focus on all the other things that you're not able to focus on right now. I like pointing out uh, this new way of thinking about uh, work because for the most part people really conflate this, that we even in our language we say like you know we go to work and it's like our job. Uh, people talk about how you know work is meaningful and these things that don't have work and there's no meaning. Uh, so these are like essentially three different concepts in a tech that you can imagine that there's some over. Uh, but you know, not all work is a job, not all jobs work, not all work is meaningful, not all jobs are meaningful. Uh, but you can see that there is you know, there's paid work, and then there's fulfilling work, and there's fulfilling jobs. And 
There's also a problem with working not actually leading to people being out of poverty. And so this is market working poverty, and it's essentially a market failure. You know, poverty is not lack of access to resources. Uh, well, it's a lack of access to resources. That's a very good flaw. And it's also a very temporary state. 40% of those between 25 and 60 experience poverty for at least one year. It's very common, essentially, to experience poverty for at least a bit. It's also not usual that someone would experience poverty for a long time. Uh, about 3.5% 3, 3 live in poverty for three years or longer. Just 24% of those in poverty are able bodied working adults now are working. <laughs> Forty-seven percent of the U.S. can't handle an unforeseen expense of four hundred dollars, and equivalents uh, to a loss of, of thirteen to fourteen decade points as well. We're just worried about uh, covering our basic needs as well. It's very expensive to be poor, uh, and we know that cash is the most effective tool to end hunger. Where markets exist, and just uh, doing it. This I consider to be one of the most disturbing uh, charts that I've found in my basic uh, research. So this is uh, this is done from uh, scans of children's brains and their spelling, and we see that. We see that uh, essentially income doesn't make much of a difference uh, for brain development as long as there is essentially enough. But as soon as kids are in sufficient amounts of uh, poverty, then you see like a huge drop off. And so we're essentially effectively causing brain damage in uh, the significant portion of the population of children. And uh, that's something that we are. I don't know, I would say consider that that's effectively uh, society-wide child abuse that we're doing. Um, allowing any child uh, to be raised in poverty. What about the safety net that we have? This is uh, this is what really angered me uh, as I got into studying about the basic income, is that I made assumptions and I think a lot of you Skin milk, you can't buy whole milk, you can buy egg. 
where I live in New Orleans, my closest store, the, the grocery store that I go, go, go to every day, they put up a, a paper sign that said that they're temporarily unable to receive WIC, and that sign went up in October, and it's still up. So places that you would, uh, that should be something that you would think can, you know, just stop accepting any plan. And uh, we work that a lot. TANF is one of our worst programs that's temporary assistance for needy families. And this is the result of welfare reform under Bill Clinton in the 90s. Right now, one out of five people who qualify uh, receive it. And 48% of those who get it are kicked off or they quit. And it's been measured that TANF has actually grown our white black child poverty gap by 15%. It's able to do this because it's a block grant system and states that have uh, disproportionately more African Americans in the population receiving it, they include a lot more conditions on the assistance. And then for states that are disproportionately more white, have a lot fewer conditions. The result of this is that you're actually racially harming people uh, because of this difference in welfare. Even though at their level, it's, it's technically illegal to, you know, alter the amount of welfare that people get based on race. Housing too, out of every four people who qualify for housing, one gets it. Uh, in New Orleans, the wait list for housing is of over 10 years. For disability, one in every five people in America with disability get any kind of assistance. And uh, on average, so there are right now there's a million people waiting to prove they're sufficiently disabled. And on average, they're waiting two years. And over 10,000 people die every year while they wait to prove that they're sufficiently disabled. If you combine these programs together, if you look at SNAP and TANF together, that is still 75% of the federal poverty line in every state except New Hampshire. I highly suggest that everybody reads Tyranny of Kindness by Tracy Pinchello to really get into the uh, just horrifying personal stories uh, that are out there as well about just how bad our system is, uh, just how many people fall through it, what that means uh, in human terms. The welfare club is an important element for our system to understand. Uh, it's a result of stacking conditional programs on public conditional programs instead of uh, universal programs and unconditional programs. So you can see, if you have enough programs stacked up, then you need to find a job that uh, pays quite a bit in order for it to make sense to actually accept that job. Wow. Uh, any kind of part-time employment or lower wage employment is going to leave you worse off, so why bother? Conditions, of course, also mean you've got these uh, only negative errors and exclusions we've talked about before. And uh, this is a really interesting statistic to you. It says 75% of the malnourished are not actually found in the bottom 20%, and half are not found in the bottom 40%. So you would think that if you say targeted the bottom 40%, that you would handle you know, like most people who are malnourished. Uh, but that's not a good thing in here. So this again helps show how important it is in a universal program that doesn't decide uh, based on the income, uh, who needs more income than each other. So why is everybody so poor? Well, until the 70s, uh, our incomes from that we got from wages uh, grew right up to productivity and then decoupled and has been flat since the 70s. Productivity has continued to rise. Uh, since I was born, you know, we're twice as productive as I was as we were then. 
You know, we used to have, uh, used to be able to do single earner households with the American dream, and that's, um, uh, if you look kind of at zooming in on what this looks like to, like, quintile, you'll see that the bottom 20% actually had the most growth uh, over time, and, but everyone pretty much benefited. Uh, prior to that, the health line. Uh, since the 70s, you see that uh, essentially about 20% has lost out, and the next 20% has just barely budged. And uh, pretty much the only ones getting anything, and it's even less than what we used to get, but they still get most of it. And then you, you don't see it in here, but if there was like a top 1%, then that's where like, all the growth was going. So why is this? Like, what, what, what is the cause of this massive uh, decoupling? And I think one of the clues is uh, shown in this picture here. It's just a very near image, like, as far as unions and uh, inequality. And I think that we see that because the unions are, are bargaining power. If you have bargaining power,
for any of the refused work, which is both its greatest strength and its positive most concern. Now, we all know that every time we talk about basic income, one of the common questions is, will everybody stop working? And it's part of the problem is that all these, you know, these, a lot of these issues are because we don't have that power to refuse to work. I made this to try and uh, explain basic income uh, as far as cost goes. So you can see if we provided a $12,000 per year floor for everybody, then we're going to have a crossover point because you're going to have to have taxes to pay for it. And everyone over on this side are going to be the net payers. So, you know, these are over here you've got the billionaires, Bill Gates, and Jeff Bezos and stuff. And they're still getting this floor, but they are not net recipients. And over here, they are paying in additional taxes, but they are still net recipients. They're still receiving more in the UBI than they're paying. And once you see, too, that there is such a thing as net recipients and net payers, then it's also a lot cheaper. Like, they're, the headline cost, we'll say it's over $3 trillion, it's, it's not meaningful to say that that's the cost, because there is no cost if someone is paying $12,000 and getting $12,000. That's a, there's no movement there whatsoever, it's zero. And so essentially, everyone who's a net payer is paying for their own base income. They're just paying it and paying it back. The cost is essentially right here. It's the, you know, it's this amount. So it's a, the actual the net cost of base income is much cheaper than the uh, full net cost. I calculated it just to give an idea. So under Andrew Davis Freedom Movement, this is why I model that. You can see that, that pretty much the, the only net payers are in the top D style. And pretty much everyone else is a net beneficiary of the dividend uh, after the 10% value of the tax. Only the top are paying more than they're receiving because they're consuming so much. So what happens if everyone gets $1,000 per month in the first place game? Well, Tenet and SNAP and other programs like that no longer need to exist. The welfare clips are eliminated because nothing is lost with work. Everyone is always better off earning additional income on top of UBI than they are not earning anything on top of UBI. Because it's fully universal, all type 2 errors are eliminated. There's no such thing as three out of four people not getting it, or one out of four people not getting it. All that is gone. It's five out of five people get it. It's completely covered. It's completely covered. We also make sure that all forms of work are recognized. So all of the unpaid work going on that we can value as being a trillion dollars per year or more, that's recognized. We're also enabling people to choose that work. Uh, Whereas right now they may not be able to. And also, minimum wage laws exist right now because people will work uh, for any amount. People will work uh, for as little as, as possible because it's you know, a tiny amount is better than nothing. So, the government has to come in and set a wage floor and say that you, know, you can't pay less than this. Uh, but if everyone actually is receiving an unconditional amount, then you can actually demand higher wages. Uh, like, for example, I have a basic income of over $1,000 a month, and I'm not going to, say, accept a you know, $10 an hour job uh, as a creator at Walmart or something. But if I have the ability to say, no, I don't need that. Uh, maybe if they pay me $20 or $30 or $40 or $50 an hour or something, then uh, I'd be more likely to do that. So it's really about your lack of uh, power uh, that uh, minimum wage is to exist. Here's a 
Here's a quote from Friedrich Hayek. There is any important issue of security of protection against risk of common to all. Here, however, an important distinction has to be drawn between two conceptions of security. A limited security, which can be achieved for all, and which therefore no privilege, and absolute security, which in a free society cannot be achieved for all. The first of these is security against severe physical privation, the assurance of a given minimum of sustenance for all, and the second is the assurance of a given standard of life. So this is high basically explaining the difference between a guarantee of opportunity and a guarantee of outcome. Here's Martin Luther King's famous quote, I am now convinced that the simplest approach will prove to be the most effective. The solution to poverty is to abolish the directly, but you know why we discuss measures to guarantee income. So, Martin Luther King, of course, is can be seen as very much on the left. Friedrich Hayek is very much on the right. And both agree that it's a good idea. So, when you're speaking to those on the right, uh, the reasons that, that they commonly uh, like basing on is that there's no more need for our 300 plus government conditional programs. <laughs> we can also simplify the tax code greatly as a result of this. Again, there's less income than the wages. And uh, because we can reduce the uh, administrative overhead, then that can be constrained inside the government. Support from the left, that's the elimination of poverty with the stroke of a pen. We would reduce inequality greatly. Uh, an analysis of, of Andrew Yang's freedom dividends would be a reduction of inequality of 15%. There would be no more holes in the safety net, and would actually have uh, $12,000 a month, $12,000 a year instead of so nothing. And again, this is a universal strike fund. So on an individual level, you can have bargaining power, but also unions themselves just have more bargaining power. Because even right now, we need to have, say, a strike fund of $1,000 a month for everyone who wants to strike. And uh, essentially, they can't you know, last. We can't be on strike for, for years. There's always a limit to how much, the, uh, how much you can strike, how long you can strike for based on the size of your strike fund. So this is a unlimited strike fund. <laughs> this is interesting. Across the world, you can see that the young are the most interested in the UBF. And I think that says a lot about just how likely it is that it's going to be seen in country after country uh, as time goes on. Just across the board. Uh, the young uh, understand the need for like the most. So as far as the evidence for raising income, there's uh, actually a lot out there. And uh, we experimented with uh, guaranteed income in the 70s. Nixon proposed it in 69. It passed the House in 70 and 71, and it was stopped on the Senate. But as part of this period of American history, there were a lot of experiments. We experimented in New Jersey, North Carolina, and uh, Seattle, and Denver, and Indiana. Experiments all over. In Canada, they also experimented with this. In the town of Delta, Manitoba, they practically eliminated poverty entirely for five years. There have been numerous basic income pilots in Namibia and India uh, in the early 2000s. There have been studies of cash transfer programs all over the world, both uh, conditional and unconditional cash. Indirectly, has been doing unconditional cash transfers in Uganda and Kenya, and it's also currently doing a 12 year UBI experiment. There's also stuff to learn from uh, lottery winners who have who are currently receiving around a thousand dollars a month uh, in a lifelong uh, payment. And there's some interesting data in there too. Uh, the closest thing in the world to UBI has been in the Hong Kong since 1982, where they received around uh, one thousand to two thousand dollars uh, per year in dividends. And there's also a really interesting 
engaged in natural experiments in North Carolina that was a result of the Great Smoky Mountain study in June. That was where that a natural experiment happened when a 10-year-long study of children being raised in poverty uh, kind of changed into something much more uh, fortuitous when a significant percentage of those kids, uh, their parents started receiving dividends. So we got to see what is the effect of a basic income on uh, kids and their families. And there's even more than this, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of puzzle pieces together. And then I put this together as far as being a summary of all these puzzle pieces. So you can kind of see it all at once. So one of the uh, results, actually it's going to be observed multiple times, uh, a lot of these have been observed multiple times, is that there is no social statement. So people did not perceive the receipt of their UBI as being some kind of charity or uh, some kind of you know, something that makes them like less of a person to receive. They happily uh, received it. In the 70s, uh, when we looked at the work effects of all these uh, experiments across the country in the US, Primary banks <laughs> spend more time job searching. So whenever someone says that they saw some growth reductions in these experiments, it's, it's true, but the context is important. It's not that, that primary earning males actually, uh, let's say, reduced their working hours. What they did is they actually spent more time between jobs looking for the next job. And you can see that that's actually it can be quite positive because if people are holding out and you know, finding the job that's best for them, then they're going to have higher wages. Uh, grades have improved as well, 
students are going to focus more on school, uh, that is a result of less stressful home environments. And uh, also with their family being able to work with them instead of uh, you know, kids having to do so on their own. A big one was hospitalization rates declining by 8.5% of that in the Delta and the potential of the experiment. So you can see there, that's a really profound one because most health outcomes are a result of these social determinants of health. It's our environment. So it doesn't really make much sense to just treat people who are getting sick over and over and over again instead of making sure that fewer people get sick because more people are healthier. And that's what we saw with uh, basically the American. In the media, crime fell over 40%. And a specific type of crime uh, actually fell 95%. That was poaching, uh, or otherwise known as illegal hunting. And I think that's a, that's a good, good thing to, to focus on, because there's certain crimes that we really do out of desperation and necessity, and we really do not want to do. And I think that's a good example of one of those. Also in the 70s, home ownership rates increased uh, 26%. So that was a very surprising finding, too, because everyone knew it was temporary. It was temporary because so many people actually were able to buy houses that wouldn't be able to buy houses. That's an important finding, too, because that leads directly to uh, the next one, which was that inflation does not increase. So if there's more people buying houses, then that's going to put down the pressure on rents. And this inflation is on increased finding of 0.1%. Uh, that's the result of a very recent uh, paper and study that Gibrecht did. And this was a very large cash transfer that was the size of 15% of GDP. So you think that a very large cash transfer of that size uh, would cause some kind of inflationary effects, but it, it didn't. Another common finding is that fresh fruits and vegetables are consumed, and I think that's related to, to better health outcomes. You know, there's a lot of people right now who are, you know, eating, say, fast foods, um, these very sort of foods, uh, you know, they, they're eating them because they're cheap and they're fast, and uh, that's really the only options. But if you have a base income, then you're able to focus on the options that you actually want for and just kind of can't afford it with your money or time. A big concern, of course, is the increase in drug usage, and that's completely not uh, the case at all. Uh, there's a meta analysis done in over 30 studies, and they found actually a slight decrease in alcohol and tobacco use. The belief that people will use their base income on drugs and alcohol and stuff is just completely uh, baseless. Another common finding is that savings go up and debts go down. People do not use their incomes to get more debt. They actually choose to get out of debt and they choose to build up their savings. And I think the entrepreneurship findings are some of the, the most fascinating because uh, a lot of people are really kind of focused on that and you know what people will do when they stop working, da da da. But it turns out that people really want to be self-employed. They really want to start their own businesses. So in the media, uh, entrepreneurship increased 301% huge injuries. And part of the reason this happens, I think, too, is you're creating customers and not just capital for people to use. Here's a bit more of the, the overall findings of entrepreneurship. In Liberia, one third of recipients from their businesses. In India, recipients were three times as likely to start a business. They were twice as likely to increase their working hours as those in control villages. And one third of all women who started their own businesses in India would be high. In Kenya, when 
we were given cash unconditionally. They looked at the findings later, like about a decade later, and they found that 90% of people who received that income used it to either start their own business or purchase a home with capital, which is usually lifestyle. So I've always asked a lot, you know, with all these positive effects, what are the negative effects? They say that this is all about buying a whole world kind of thing. So uh, there were people who complained about UBI and the experiments, and they were the money holders. They did not appreciate how people were in less need of income to the point that they would say yes to, you know, a thousand percent interest loans and these kind of things. So money that was not happy about it. Uh, also, wage labor was harder to find because people were so interested in doing their own work, be it uh, unpaid or self-employed, that it was harder to find people to pay the wage labor, which, of course, you know, the result of that should be higher wages. And if you're an abusive, uh, say, spouse, then this independence of women uh, could be something that you don't like, but of course I consider that to be a good thing, but they themselves might consider that to be a bad thing. So how do we fund the base income? Well, you know, really we're already funding quite a lot of them. Here's a chart of a bunch of our expenses. And it's interesting how uh, welfare is something that we consider to be uh, you know, something that we, that we don't like and have its own name. And uh, tax expenditures are considered to be entirely different from welfare, even though both increase people's disposable incomes but welfare is different for some reason. Tax expenditures are really welfare for the rich and the middle class. And on an average, every year, we do $1.5 trillion in tax expenditures. And 17% of that $1.5 trillion goes to the top 1%. I also think that we should see basic income as our return on investment as taxpayers. I really like this chart from uh, Marianne Ricardo's research, where she goes into just how much government funding went into the IFL. And pretty much everything you see had government funding. So these were our tax dollars that are paying for these technologies uh, that are employing us. And where is our return on investment? Where is our dividend for all of this research and technology that we have made possible? Well, there's a lot of revenue options to consider uh, besides elimination of tax expenditures. Uh, I like the value added tax and have long recommended a 10% value added tax at the starting point. Uh, we do sales taxes at a local level for like citywide, uh, statewide UBIs. Financial transaction taxes are another source. Carbon taxes are another source. Both of those are part of the freedom of the uh, funding as well. And I also think that we should treat citizens and shareholders to get like the, uh, the iPhone uh, chart. But uh, I think there's other ways too that we should consider, like in Alaska, that uh, our natural resources are collectively ours, not just oil, uh, everything, you know, water, uh, minerals, solar power, wind, like all of these things we should consider to be uh, ours together. And I think there's lots of uh, ability uh, for patents too. I, I like the idea of like a a kind of a carbon fee and dividend approach to patents, where we charge people uh, an annual amount to keep their intellectual property uh, monopolies. And that way, we incentivize people. 
able to either continue to pay more or to keep the down the public domain, which would result in a higher and higher DVI. Or uh, if they if it's too expensive, like say if Disney doesn't want to spend five billion dollars to keep Mickey Mouse over the public domain, then Mickey Mouse finally enters the public domain, which is actually great for everybody. Uh, we actually want the rich public domain. Land related taxes are another thing that I think we should consider, especially on the state level. And this is a tax on the unproved value of land. So let's say you have a parking lot next to a skyscraper and they're both the same size of the lot, they would both pay the same amount of tax. So this was incentivized the development of unused land, uh, especially in cities, and encourage people to increase the housing supply, which would be great for lowering rents. And because of the, the land value is socially created, then we would all be receiving a regular dividend for the value that we're creating in the terms of uh, land value. I also like to Norwich reform as a possibility. So Norwich reform is uh, reforming the way that we create money. So right now, the banks are creating money out of debt. That's how our monetary supply is, is grown. And of course, they're receiving this benefit privately and on a public basis. It just seems to make more sense to say banks can't create money anymore. And then we would create the amount of money that we need for expanded money supply. And that would just start in everybody's hands, tax, uh, tax and debt free, instead of actually uh, incurring debt and uh, stuff that would be interest on. So uh, that would be an interesting way of you know, increasing the size of the EBI uh, without actually any taxes being required. And then, of course, are the savings for basic income as well. So you're going to see lower run, better health. Uh, our educational expenses go further, our productivity, that kind of thing. So it's very affordable to look at it through that perspective because poverty is so hugely expensive. What kind of supports have existed for basic income over the years? There's a very uh, diverse list, I feel. First of all, a lot of Nobel laureates have supported UBI. Uh, 11 living Nobel laureates support UBI, and over the years, more have like the Bill Friedman and Friedman Hayek. There are trade unions that support UBI. Uh, most of that support is in like the UK, like, those unions seem to like it more like American unions, but it, it depends. But it is interesting to see kind of the debate among unions as to if UBI is a good idea or not. Because of, I mean, they should like it because it increases bargaining power and it would help them. But on the other side, uh, it can decrease the, say, the power of an uh, individual in the union. Maybe they want to keep that. Uh, the Canadian Medical Association has endorsed basic income. I would love to see the American Medical Association do that. They have done that yet. CMAX. Canadian Association, you know, Canadian Association of Social Workers has endorsed EPI. So uh, that would be great. That, that, that really shows that these social workers actually care about the outcomes instead of just their own jobs. The Movement for Black Lives has endorsed basic income. Various environmentalists have, venture capitalists have, Marxists have, former US presidents have, sex workers open university has, and uh, organizations that give directly and by combinator are both experimenting with TBI on their own. Billionaires supported, and again at the end of uh, food banks supported. Where might we see it first? Switzerland could have been first. They voted on it in 2016. They voted no, but 23% of the entire country voted yes. Interestingly, in history, uh, they will vote a lot of things repeatedly. And so just because something in the past doesn't mean that it never will. Uh, another example earlier was 
is that Switzerland voted on something, they voted it down at the same level, and 12 years later, they overwhelmingly passed it. What was that measure? It was the right for women to vote. So I think that Switzerland will probably follow that same one and recognize in the not too distant future that everyone in Switzerland has the right to face in. The Netherlands are experimenting with it. Finland experimented with it for two years, and the preliminary results are out, but the final results are actually not out yet. Uh, they're expecting sometime this year. There was an experiment in Ontario that was very unfortunately canceled. That was a purely ideological decision by Doug Ford after being elected. What happened was he promised during his campaign that if elected, he would not get rid of the experiment. After being elected, he once again said he would not get rid of the experiment. And then shortly thereafter, he ended the experiment. There was no data at all yet to use. And it was already funded. Uh, they were already a third of the way through. And uh, yeah, it was just completely throughout all that. There was no data ever reflected except for the baseline data. Healy Gregory again is doing a 12 year experiment, very large experiment, um, very interesting stuff. And you can actually see live uh, examples of what people are using for it to go to their site. So I thought that there was a possibility that they would even um, start uh, a couple years ago, or even just last year, but not yet. But they're very interesting. Scotland is also extremely interested. It seems likely that if Scotland does vote to be its own country separate from the UK, then um, they would likely adopt UBI. A lot of people don't know that Brazil actually passed base income in 2004. It's a law that's on the books, but there's an asterisk there because it's up to the president of Brazil to actually uh, implement it. And no president has done that yet. There's also a lot of pilots going on in the US that uh, you know makes makes us a great great possibility aside from Andrew Yang winning the presidency and uh, hopefully the rest of us forcing the country to uh, adopt it. But there's yeah, a lot of interesting stuff going on in the city. And I also think that, that China is a potential possibility that no one really talks about because there is no kind of democratic consensus there. They could just decide one day that it would be great for the Chinese economy and just implement a ABI. Here's just a map of the kind of get an idea of the fall of the around the world that I would think of this or have a dumb experiment of some kind or have something going on. So when time we agree on nothing basically the most potential to be an idea that can get support from across the entire political spectrum and bring people together finally at the same table. It will not solve every problem, but is the precondition for solving many otherwise unsolvable problems. The idea is not the only change we need to make, but it's the one change that will have the widest range of emergent effects. Kind of emergent effects on the need. Well, if we have a UDI, then we can decide better about uh, the amount of hours that we work. And if automation is going to eliminate half of our jobs in the next 20 years, then we can also work half as much, uh, just as we should or be doing based on being twice as productive as we are now than we were in the 1970s. We can also incentivize citizenship. So, I know another common fear is that UBI would cause a bunch of immigration. A uh, bunch of people would have to flood into the country to get their base income. Uh, but the thing is, if citizens are the only ones who get it, then you are incentivizing legal immigration instead of uh, illegal immigration. It's also, we're going to expect to see much more engagement in political activism. I think the Yang Men is a great example of this as far as people pursuing something that's important to them politically and just how much work that that takes. And uh, you, know, you need to have the money and the time to focus on that. So 
So we expect to see a lot more citizen engagement with the UBI. I think a lot of the reason that that people don't vote. Uh, so if you look at those earning over six figures, 80% on average will vote. And if you look at those earning less than fifteen thousand dollars on average, about a third of them will vote. I think part of that is because people are afraid that they be late to work, uh, so they say no. It's not. It's not worth it. see a lot more voting as a result of as well. <coughs> more people volunteering, and of course, with this tax, this burden, this cognitive burden that we'll from our minds, that we'll be able to think more long term instead of short term. We'll also be able to do more parenting and other care work. Uh, I think that's a really important part of EBI is that it will fix this kind of situation. It's pretty ridiculous right now when essentially two parents can leave each other's kids each day to watch each other's kids for money instead of just staying home and raising their own kids uh, and not receiving any money because they actually have the ability to use the BDI. There's also less need for patents and copyrights. I think IP reform is very difficult to do outside of having basic income because people are just concerned about this insecurity of knowing that they may not have income and their fence might not might need income later. So you just see that people agreeing to larger, longer copyright protections, even though those protections mostly protect the giant corporations like Disney and not like just individual authors and people like that. Again, we'll see a lot less crime, improved health, and uh, I think we'll see degrowth too. Uh, I think that a big part of the problem is we have this infant growth paradigm because you know, that means that people need to uh, you know, earn as much as they can and uh, all the earnings increase we get from growth. Whereas if we actually implement the UBI, Transfer through the whatever taxes does, whatever systems we set up. And that's essentially creating a, a closed loop, like a you know a circulatory system for the economy. Installing EBI would be thought of like a part for pumping the money around instead of having this system where you have to grow, 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 grow forever. I think an example of that in practice would be those same parents who instead of driving to work every day somewhere else, they can actually stay home. So you can see that there would be you know, this less lower utilization of resources as one of those uh, results. There would be a reduced demand in the high cost of living areas. This is a, a strong answer to fears about increased rent because if you have a fully universal based income, then people are free to move from high cost of living area cities to lower cost of living area uh, towns and areas and these kind of things. Because you want to make your dollar go further. Right now you are locked in to cities uh, because those are where all the jobs are. And so when landlords want to raise your rent, you can't really say no. But the basic income that changes and you essentially create competition between landlords across the country instead of just in cities. You can also imagine a lot more startups uh, because it essentially be a giant incubator that instead of requiring some kind of capital uh, to get together for enough people to work on something, everyone would already have sufficient money to work on something. And so therefore you could actually just start working on something and not worry about uh, viability as far as profit goes for uh, quite a while. And then just, yeah, what do you think? What can you think of as far as other emerging effects? If you really think about that over time, then uh, you know, you'll come up with some interesting other results. Here's just kind of like a, a chart to think about an like imaginary situation as far as the existing market without a base income. So you've got uh, you've got all these people in jobs. And let's 
say half of them do not want to be where they are, and you've also got a whole bunch of people outside the market that have a labor market that can't find jobs that want them. And so, you know, you've got people who are refusing to quit their jobs that they hate because they need to keep earning income, and you've got people unable to earn income who really want to who are stuck. And so, if you have this income, you can see a reorganization that would happen where hopefully people who feel that they, that they don't need to work to earn this income uh, could drop out of the labor market and choose to do part time work instead as well. And you, that would free up the people who were locked out of the labor market and they could actually get into it. And then the result, of, of course, the result of all this is that you have a higher productivity because the people who want jobs and those jobs that they're in would actually be in them. And then the people who don't want to would be outside them and they can either be doing unpaid work or even nothing. And that's fine because then we're still more productive and everyone is better off than they were before. <laughs> so key understanding is that technology has been making things worse and so better for decades. And we ain't seen nothing yet. We have stubbornly refused to fix the primary flaw in our system that not working isn't really an option. So no one has any real bargaining power outside of unions. And no one has any consumer buying power outside of employment. But introducing unconditional basic income, we can correct that flaw and consequently welcome technology to work for us instead of against us. Freeing us all to seek purpose over survival and abundance over scarcity. Jobs are for machines. Life is for people. I think that's what we should be aiming for using our technology. <laughs> so for more information, here's my website. And uh, basicinthedata.com is a way of getting daily basic news around the world. And uh, basicinthedata.org is a really good resource as well. Incomes go up around the world, for example, especially in developing countries. Uh, one of the first things that happens is people begin to add more meat to their diet, um, which has a higher carbon output. Um, you had a statistic there that what, I think it was 26% of people will um, move into home ownership, um, which has a higher carbon output than um, uh, apartments would. So I'm, I'm still trying to understand how that relationship works. And there's obviously going to be some benefits each direction, but it seems to me I'm, I'm still having trouble figuring out how that how that's a benefit in that in that case. Yeah. So uh, you know, first of all, I just think it's interesting that I mean, I, I, I hear that often. I know that that's that's something that's a concern. And but another way of thinking about that too is that we're saying that maybe it's a good thing for people to live in poverty because it's actually better for the environment. And I think that's kind of, uh, uh, I, don't know, I would say, a moral stance, right? But also just, you know, very questionable. But on top of that, you know, there are actually uh, some really important reasons for basically you know, from the environmental perspective. And that's that we, again, we, we focus on short-term thinking is a long-term thing as long as we're economically insecure. So again, like imagine when it comes to all the bullshit jobs that are out there. Like there's just so many jobs out there that are just completely useless as far as any uh, social or economic reasons for it. It's just kind of like going through motions. And that means that we're driving to and from these bullshit jobs. Uh, it also means that like non-bullshit jobs exist because of that, uh, on only because of that. So let's say you could have a you could have a uh, an office full of bullshit jobs, and then of 
course, you know, they need janitorial service and that kind of thing. So, like, that's a real job, but it's a real job that only needs to exist because of all the bullshit jobs. <laughs> so, uh, the estimates as far as bullshit jobs uh, vary from what I've seen. And, like, on the lower end, there's potentially around 10% of uh, all jobs that are completely uh, unnecessary. And I've seen it as high as, like, uh, 30% of jobs that are unnecessary. So, from that perspective, and freeing people from that kind of thing, then we could seriously decrease our carbon footprint. And I think part of this too is part-time work, uh, which would also decrease our, 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 our carbon footprint. And I also believe that part of the funding mechanism for UBI can and should be used as well. This is, uh, they're called Pagovian taxes. Yes. So for Frank is familiar with Pagovian taxes, this is a way of actually improving the market mechanism uh, due to externalities. So an externality is when, let's say, pollution is a well-known externality. And say, you know, the, the cost of gasoline is actually much cheaper than it should be because we're just burning it and putting it out there. And then let's say people are getting um, asthma and cancer and everything else, and of course all the effects of global warming. And none of that cost is calculated into it. So a Govian tax is meant to attempt to calculate what is not being calculated, and then we add it on top of it as a tax. So a carbon tax is a great Govian tax, and uh, there are others we do as well. So that way we're actually disincentivizing these uh, things that are bad for global warming, and we're actually incentivizing these sustainable energies because they're actually cheaper now compared to the other ones. And at the same time, that revenue is actually going to everybody to you know, reduce poverty, reduce inequality. So it's like a two words to one stone kind of thing to use Pagovian taxes to fund basic income. Yeah, I'm very helpful. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. You mentioned having sort of generally a flat value added tax and a flat nationwide uh, basic income. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't, because you have sorts of varying costs of living in different states and especially in urban areas, why not have that vary from state to state? Yeah, so I think it's really important to have a fully universal basic income uh, across the entire nation because then that's where you actually incentivize people to find these like lower cost of living areas. You, you essentially make people more mobile and they're able to seek out and, and move and you know, change their situations. Whereas if you attempt to adjust it at a national level, then you're almost baking in these differences and you're even kind of subsidizing uh, these landlords who are charging exorbitant rents because you're giving them more money. Uh, you actually want there to be that incentive for people to say, no, I don't want to live here, it's too expensive, and my amount is $1,000, and my $1,000 will stretch a lot further if I go to like a rural area, then that would make sense. But that doesn't mean that we can't have state-level dividends, you know, just like Alaska. So when we, when the first freedom dividend goes out, you're still going to be having people in Alaska earning their dividends on top of it. And I highly recommend that state after state do this as well. You know, like Colorado has, uh, after they legalized marijuana, they basically had a problem of figuring out what the heck they're going to do with all the money because they were earning so much, so much of it that it was actually more than they expected. And so they could have done like a marijuana dividend and uh, I ex Maine and, uh, let's see, Maine and, is it Massachusetts? But definitely Maine, they're looking actually at a marijuana dividend at the state level as well. And uh, other states are trying to figure out what they can do uh, to fund basic income statewide. So I, I think that we can do, you know, we have the, the federal UBI and we have the state UBI and we can even have like citywide UBIs as well. Uh, you can have like a UBI in, in New York or San Francisco based off like the, the value of land is like a land value tax dividend is something I would like to see. Uh, but then, yeah, that's just 
a way of compensating for these higher things if it's up to states and cities instead of the nation. Yes? Why do you suppose only a slight decrease in alcohol and tobacco use? It seems like with less stress with UBI, the decrease might be unless that's not right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, first of all, I, I think it's interesting how, like, uh, uh, you know, it's like I love drink, you know? <laughs> I love going out for beers. And, uh, and that's fine, apparently. But then if you're, like, poor, then you go out for a beer. And that's like, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, so I think, you know, there's, it's just something normal. And it's just about, like, uh, if, you're, if you're doing a lot of it because you're in poverty and you're economically insecure, then that can reduce. Uh, then also you're going to help your position. You have more money, then you can, like, buy more alcohol or, or whatever if you want to, and but then we're okay with that uh, and consider that like good for the economy because like if the middle class is doing that, then that's fine. So I, I think there's something going on there uh, that's part of that. But I, it is really interesting to see that, uh, especially in certain circumstances, like in the North Carolina experiment with the Smoky Mountain study of youth. The, the parents did see a, a, a significant reduction in alcohol usage there. And that was um, yeah, as a result of there being so much less stress in the household. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, it's, you're going to see both. I guess another way of looking at it, too, is uh, similar to a finding from uh, Alaska, which is that they found uh, that when it came to full-time employment, some people reduced their working hours because of the dividend, but then the dividend created more consumption, which created more jobs, which increased the amount, you know, the amount of their full-time jobs. So that was essentially a neutral effect. So yeah, I think that's probably something like that going on with that kind of uh, uh, usage of what they call temptation goods. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't miss this point in the middle of the week, but how do we determine how much? How much for the UBI? Yeah. How much UBI? And you know, we always talk about the thousand, but you know, I thousand is instead of space. And you know, how much do we do? And how much is there too much? Yeah, it's really interesting to to think about what the amount uh, could and say should be. I've always talked about a thousand dollars per month in the U.S. because of the way that we already define poverty. So in the, fed the federal poverty line, as we already use for every other program, is a little over $12,000 per year. And so to me, I think politically speaking, you don't have to argue over what is poverty. You just say, okay, that's what we consider to be poverty. Let's end it with $12,000 and then, you know, done. Um, but there's certainly a discussion to be had as far as uh, how high should we go or can we go. And I think that, that, like, first of all, when we adopt it, we should tie it to productivity. And so as the economy grows, as technology advances, then the floor should rise with that. And because that, again, that creates a really good incentive for automation. Like, if you, if you know that eliminating an entire sector with a new technology would raise your dividend, then, you know, you could, you could do that. But if you don't benefit from it, then why would you? So it, 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 by locking it into that, then we actually really literally make technology work for all of us as long as it grows at that rate. So that's the rate that you should grow is with productivity. But then there's also like, you know, what's the what's the like maximum amount? And I think we have to figure that out via uh, essentially trial and error. So we we don't know what is too much 
until we've increased it enough where the, uh, the demand that we have in the, the market is actually outstripping uh, the manufacturing potential. So right now we're at about 60% of our production capacity. And so you can see that there's a lot that we can actually uh, uh, have more demand and still meet that with supply without like getting into an inflationary territory. And uh, I think that would, that's plenty of room for increasing it to a, a certain amount. And then also, even when we do see inflationary effects with, say, a, a much higher base income, then uh, the question, too, is, like, is inflation bad? And I think that kind of question changes with base income, because without it, everyone's afraid of inflation because it's essentially a tax and they're not getting anything more in return. But if you are getting something in return, and it's more than the inflationary rate, then you know, you're still going to be happier. And the question is, like, who does the inflation hurt? And again, it's very much like the value-added tax in UBI. So if inflation uh, can be considered to be like a, let's say, a 10% inflation rate can be considered equivalent to like a 10% flat tax. And so, or 10% value-added tax even. But so if you, if you have that, then those at the top are going to be the ones who are worse off because effectively you know, they lose 10% of the value of their money and they only get the UBI in return. And then at the bottom, they could lose 10% of the value of their money, but then they're actually far better off because the amount of receiving is more than that. So then that's interesting, uh, is that, you know, maybe there's a reason why so many of us are worried about inflation, because I think that uh, the rich are kind of wanting us to think that way, because it helps them. Uh, an example, too, is inflation is actually bad for, for those who are doing the lending, but it's good for the people who are receiving the loans. You know, if you get a, you know, $400,000 mortgage over, you know, 30 years or something, and there's a lot of inflation, then you're paying off $400,000 that is worth less than it was. And so you benefit from that, but like, then say the rich do not benefit from that. So I think it's just kind of interesting how wide a fear that is, and like, I'm curious to understand like where that came from. And why? But I think that we should aim for you know, what is the max amount we can do. And so I'm fully in support of just continually expanding it and then just coming up as a society and thinking, do we want more or less? Like, is this the right amount? Let's, let's see. Yeah. Um, so how do you stop, like, predatory loans from, like, eating up people's UBI? Yeah, so, uh, like I said, it, that, that one of the results is that these predatory lenders are essentially unable to find customers. So I, I know that's a worry that people have, is that people will, will use their dividend and be taken advantage of. But in reality, people will get this dividend, and they're just like, you know, screw you, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Like they actually make a point of paying off their debts uh, because people also don't like being in debt. And so that's just a natural uh, result. And so I actually think that that uh, we don't have to really worry about that as much. There should you know, still be things in, in, in place, but I don't think that it'll be, the conditions will all be worse than they are now. I have a friend who's like, he's wary of doing anything big and top down. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, why don't we try it in more cities and then at the state level and then at the national level, like when we're absolutely sure what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. What would you say to that? That kind of thing, you know, for, for one, like the data that we have is already extremely strong. Uh, like across the board, we, we know that uh, we can expect a lot of good things. And so, you know, I believe that we already have the evidence and we, we just need to do it. And uh, I mean, we, we did do that too with Social Security. 
know, that was a choice where, you know, we didn't have that. And then we thought, well, maybe we should reduce senior poverty. And so we just did it. And it's interesting, too, if you look at the history, there were people uh, in the debate about Social Security. They were like, let's hold off. And let's, like, let's like figure this out before we dive right in. And then the people on the other side were thinking, we need to hurry up and get this through before like the people who were saying that we should wait actually get their way. So it was basically rushed to try to get through. And this course has been successful, dramatically reduced senior poverty, and it's been a very successful program, and here we are. Uh, so I think that, that there's a hesitance to do big things like we, like we used to do. And I don't want to change that. Like in the 70s, actually, with, under Nixon, one of the one of the reasons why that that discussion happened was that we had just landed on the moon, and we were showing that like great things were possible. At the same time, as people had begun to feel that government was all capable of doing great things. So it's no, it's no coincidence that in 69, uh, Nixon proposed the care of the family assistance plan and we let them go. Like it was a purposeful attempt to do great things. And uh, so that's, even, that's what I would answer too, is, is that, uh, you know, where did that go? You know, we're, we're just trying to do like little experiments and stuff where it's like, we're talking about ending poverty here. Personality traits and you know just all of these things are just extremely positive, and all of this like let's hold off and like do some more experimenting. It just reminds me of Social Security, where it's just a method, like a strategy of keeping us from doing what we should be doing. Yeah, are your thoughts about how UBI would affect different markets differently? Like I guess I think of like um, Donald's Burgers cheap because one, the workers aren't paid a lot. Too, there's a lot of poor people that are driving demand for cheap food. Um, and if UBI basically eliminates both of those factors, do you end up with a situation where the only options are four main burgers uh, that are more expensive, even though they're better quality? Yeah, so I, I, think the, I, I think that McDonald's at some point will understand that they can't compete on quality, but they can't compete on cost. And so, you know, they should be aiming for like the the two dollar Big Mac or something, you know, <laughs> where you use automation to reduce that cost as much as you can. And, and that's the kind of like future where I see, that I see is that automation enables like some really cheap goods and services, but that doesn't mean that all of us actually want to use those goods and services. And there would be another market for like the human economy where we're you know there's human labor and there's you know attention to, to detail and there's uniqueness instead of like sameness. Um, I think that that's what we would see. So yes, I believe there'll be effects, and I, I, I would like to see that. And I would like to see technology trying to to increase productivity and you know make everything cheaper that we can. <coughs> And at the same time, freeing up people to do this stuff and, and charge what they feel that they should earn for that work. And uh, also enable people to do stuff for free. You know, we could have a, a gift economy within this as well, where you know we essentially get away from this uh, price system for like wager for wages and like goods. You know, you can imagine people you know, make a hamburger and say, here, it's, it's free, you know, just, just uh, carry on and do the same. And, and uh, I think that that's potential, too, is if you're freeing up people with the, with the ability uh, to actually have access to this capital and access to time and resources, then uh, I think we'll see a lot more of this, like, kind of gift economy kind of stuff. Yeah. Kind of going off of that, do you think we might see negative effects? Because when we see this money sort of increasing bargaining power for perhaps small businesses on the margins that can't afford to raise prices, do you think that might that UBI might actually force some businesses to close or hurt the bottom line? 
Well, so if, if thinking about it just on that side, then, then sure, you would introduce uh, that potential, but at the same time, you're also introducing a ton more uh, consumer buying power and spending. So let's say a small business uh, who, let's say they would be hurt by a $15 minimum wage because they couldn't raise their prices to absorb that, maybe that could go into business. Uh, you can see that if suddenly everyone in the community has more money to spend, then their revenue would go up quite a bit, and that that would enable them to cover the costs that their workers are demanding because they have the bargaining power to do so. So yeah, there are, there are examples. Uh, I, I think that for small businesses, especially the small like local businesses, you see uh, just a lot more uh, beneficial effects from the demand increase than you would from uh, any kind of effect from uh, you know, raises, in, raises in wages. Okay. Especially if they're like family businesses, because like, you know, you have like family members and they're not going to be like, I refuse to work for you unless you give me $20 an hour or something like that. You know, it's like, hey, we all have basic income, so you can come to work. <laughs> So you talked about some of the assistance programs and how they might only cover three out of four, you know, weeks in the month. Mm -hmm. Does that, does, has there been any, with some of these UBI experiments, has there been anything that, where they pay it weekly instead of monthly, or is there anything like that that has proven to be more successful? Yeah, there are differences uh, as far as, you know, how often it's paid. Um, but I haven't seen anything that really shows that, let's say, weekly is better than monthly. Uh, I, I think it's kind of a sweet spot at, at a month, uh, just because it means that you have to send out less lower bureaucracy, I mean, lower administrative costs, it's only once a month. And uh, it's also because you kind of combine it, there's a little bit more of a, a uh, you know, windfall effect for buying like, larger purchases instead of the smaller ones and therefore you're going to be able to buy something that's more expensive all at once. So I, I think that that's useful too for the for the once a month. But I also know people are used to twice a month through wages or salaries. So that's like something that's just normal. So that certainly could be a, a way of going about it. But I don't think that it's, it's extremely important to vary uh, or even like put a whole lot of work into uh, just how often to do it, as long as it's one the, once a month, then people can plan around it and they know it's there. And uh, it really just makes all the difference in the world knowing that you have a floor that you can add your income on top of. And do you think it would be more standard? I, you know, I'm just thinking of uh, how crazy the grocery store is when the 15th and Friday sometimes line up. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. They, 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 they might want to, you know, kind of stagger it for, for payments um, to avoid like everyone having the amount on the same day. But uh, yeah, no, I haven't really seen anything as far as that's concerned. Just like people wondering. Yeah. Um, uh, for the uh, way we pay for possible uh, GPI plans, what do you think would be the best way to pay for it? Do you think of like an extension on sales taxes? Or, um, yeah, so uh, the, I have my plan that's uh, available online, you can see. Uh, and uh, my plan was, uh, it's the Andrew Yang's plan is, is, is heavily influenced by my plan. Uh, I, I believe that 10% VAT that is absolutely the way to go in the US because we don't have that because we know it's successful and because it just makes sense in a globalized economy to use the same tax that every other country is using too. We know it works and it generates a lot of revenue. So I'm all for that. And I also like the incentives that it, that it, leads, that it creates too, where you're effectively disincentivizing uh, consumption, uh, mass consumption, and uh, at the same time transferring buying power from you know, the rich to the, the bottom and the middle class, which is stronger for economies because the rich can't you know, keep a 70% consumer economy afloat. You need to move that, uh, that buying power to everyone else. 
So I like the bat. I like the way that it, it, it moves by power progressively from the bottom to the from the top to the bottom to the middle. Beside that, I also like carbon taxes and financial transaction taxes, and uh, I also like land value taxes at the uh, state and city level that would create dividends on top of the base income. Uh, I think those are the most important ones, you know. And also, I mentioned too uh, a bit about the the idea of a, like an intellectual property fee and dividend. Like we don't do that right now, but I, I really like the idea of uh, the way this would work is is let's say you would you would take out a patent on something or you know, have a copyright or whatever, and uh, like right now, you you, know, you get like a patent for, for ten years or something, and then you can like you know, try to get it for another ten years. And we're not really like charging them a lot for this, but what we could do is make it like really cheap and just have someone uh, renew it like every year, and it gets more and more expensive. And then the eventual result is that people are making the choice: Do I want to spend this much more money? to keep this intellectual property out of the public domain, or do I want to stop paying all this money and just let it go into the public domain? That creates this really great incentive where we're both drawing the public domain and we're increasing the revenue from those who are benefiting the most from their intellectual property monopolies that we, the people, are granting them through government. Um, so I really like that kind of new tax uh, that we don't currently do. And again, the Gobian taxes, any kind of thing like that, that uh, helps take into account externalities and uh, better aligns market incentives. I like all of that. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it, and I, and I prefer like, a combination of lots of these different things. My question on the intellectual property tax thing, or fee. Fee, yes. Uh, how, uh, what is considered intellectual property? Is it like all patents? Or is it just like images and whatnot? It's what we do for patents right now. Like if you have a patent right now, so you would take out a patent. patent made by the government 20, 30 years down the line could become a public domain. Know how to build RF twenty two fighter jets just out of out of the blue. Everyone in the world knows how to make them, just as they are right now. Well, or I mean, parts, sure. You look at existing, like or parts that are from our government uh, uh, facilities. <laughs> we know exactly how to make them, or say our uh, the uh, our software, since it's also intellectual property, we have to keep the, the companies that are maintaining them have to keep, uh, up, have to keep having the user base pay more and more for it to offset the intellectual property um, fees. But I don't think, you know, it's a design, not, it's not like you're getting an urbase code, for example. No, as soon as it becomes a public domain, they would have to make it open source and open to literally everything to be able to see it and we, we already do things right now, and I'm not saying that we should like stop doing everything that we're doing right now. I would just say increase like just the cost of the intellectual property, this copyright. Mm -hmm. right, so this is just another. This is just this is a discussion about having fun with this, though, too, not whole IP type of talk. Yeah, also, I mean, we so could like, get caught in the weeds on the, the the nuances. I'm sure that for different types of IP, one might, one might want different kinds of policies. Yeah. Um, this is just how do we pay for this? Yeah. You can reverse engineer how to build a car, but I don't see very many people out there just building their own car. <laughs> yeah, but it's like if someone got the source code to the entirety of 
they'll be able to stand up the system and just put it out on the market for free. Well, I mean, that's already going to jump like that. So, mm -hmm. the flush is Microsoft. Yeah. And they Part of the reason that the public domain is important is that you are incentivizing new advances. Yeah. So like, if Windows 10 became free, <laughs> then obviously that incentivizes much better <laughs> operating systems that do have patents because they're brand new. Yeah, Windows 3.1 yeah. might become free yeah. now and nobody would well, care. Well, we don't need to do that with comparisons between, say, Windows and Linux. The, different playlists of Linux, and, like, it's been basically, Linux has been the back code for all of our servers in the past. Okay. I, th I think we're kind of getting off yeah. here. I'm just suggesting that there are ways of coming up with funding that do incentivize things that we want and disincentivize things that we don't want, and I think that we should be considering those methods of funding. Yeah. I think that just about sales tax increase would be the best. Sales taxes could be done at a local and state level, just fine, for like statewide, citywide dividends. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, so, a big part of the whole is making sure that the rent should go up is people moving to other parts of the country. Um, one problem I've heard is that having like a uh, wealth gap between different areas of the country or like kind of like people or like poor people basically moving to specific communities and kind of having that separation. How would that, or is there ways to negate that? Yeah, I mean, again, we're just thinking about like, what if people make choices that like we don't like and maybe we should like force them not to make those choices? I mean, who are we to decide that you know it's it's bad let's actually enable them to, to move instead of keeping them where they are and then you know go from there. I, I like it. Yeah. It's just, that's one of the things I've heard that yeah. we have to debate. Uh, can we if there's one more, can we do one more and then uh Sure. What time are we at right now? 8 Almost 9. 8.50. Um, and I also want to invite everybody over to our house. We usually have a Yang Gang hangout in the <laughs> evenings. And then some people go out bar hopping, which we encourage. But you don't have to. <laughs> not, not the parents. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're just about a mile or so away. We have a house. We call it the Yang Accelerator House, where we hang out and sometimes do live streams. So oh, and you're also all invited. I uh, brought a bunch of like various like printed out like essays and articles that um, if you want to to take them you're welcome to do that like it could prove useful uh, in discussions with people too and I also brought the basic income game. <laughs> Maybe we have a board so, game. Right? Yeah, so you're welcome to to grab a copy. Uh, the basic income game is. Pretty much like uh, like Cards Against Humanity. That's kind of like similar rules to that, but instead of like uh, question and answer cards, you have the question cards, and then you write the answers that you want on like a piece of paper. And it's uh, kind of an economic theme to the game. Um, yes, if you want that, the those are there. And I only ask that if you do take it, um, then take it because you're planning to like play it in groups. Uh, with people, and uh, if you get it, just go to uh, humanityforward.org, and then there's uh, a contact page that you can click that says that you got it. That's it. And then one more thing: Does everybody know about the Revolution of Reason pre-caucus party? The day of caucus, a couple hours before, from three to six, we're going to host a small party, well, small or big party. We do have a pretty big venue, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, big. as many people as you can get to come, we'd love to have you. We're going to serve free Freedom Divot Dogs <laughs> and uh, yeah, have some music and then info sessions and making sure everybody knows where to go. Yeah, it's get, getting people out to the caucuses because you guys should, uh, should do it. It's our Iowa birthright. Yep. I mean, you've heard that every Iowans vote is 
with a thousand Californians. And he knows that he's a Californian. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give Scott a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. If you want to fly up for the. If you want to fly up for the pre-caucus party, I have. Cool.